Welcome to Safety Talk. Personal safety expert Pete Canavan shares his insights and interviews experts who provide simple and effective tips, techniques, and technologies to keep you safe and secure both online and off. Here's Pete. Hello, and welcome to Safety Talk. I am your host and personal safety expert, Pete Canavan. I'm joined by my co-host, branding and social media expert, Neil Haley. Neil, how are you? I'm doing fantastic, Pete. I can't believe we're sitting in October already, and it's moving forward, and we're, I guess we're getting countdown for Christmas. I mean, oh. that's really, it's, it's just amazing how fast a year goes by that we've been doing this show. I think the anniversary will be in December. Am I correct? Yes, I uh, think. I'm January. Just... January we started. But yeah, it's really? coming up okay. on a year fast and <laughs> yeah, furious, yeah. which blows my mind. And uh, yeah, I can't believe we're into October. And, you know, now the holiday season goes fast and furious. And, you know, we're already seeing Christmas stuff. You got Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, boom, the year's over. And here we go again. So, yep. Life, uh, life is short, people. Make the most of it. And uh, you uh, and I, and we all sort of are reminded of that every day because of the things that we see in the news. And as always, I start to show off with some safety news. And last week I touched off um, with some cybersecurity news items. We had a cybersecurity expert on uh, today. I'm going to mention some troubling offline safety news. Uh, this past Sunday, there was a shooting at a bar in Kansas, right? How many people go out to a bar? Uh, this shooting left four people dead, five other people injured. Uh, it wasn't any sort of domestic terrorism. They believe it was the result of some sort of dispute that was at the bar earlier in the evening. But, you know, people can't just, you know, give their two cents and leave. These individuals had to leave, come back with guns and start shooting the place up. So, you know, it's one thirty in the morning and there's 40 people in the bar. And can you imagine being in a tightly confined space such as that, uh, you know, that really raises your risk level dramatically because there's really, you know, not not many places to go, you know, if you're in a real, you know, small, you know, neighborhood bar type situation. So, uh, you know, people running for the exit. Some of those people were ones that, that were shot and injured. So you could just imagine the chaos in a situation like that. Now, as an outsider, right, we're sitting, we're listening to this uh, or wherever you happen to be. And, you know, it's easier for, for us to maybe say, okay, what people should have done, what they could have done, et cetera. But the bottom line is that, you know, if you were in that bar, if I were in that bar, you know, and people were causing trouble, it would probably be, you know, before it got to the point of escalation that we want to leave. But, you know, maybe we're there, we're a bunch of friends, we're having a good time, these people left, okay, great, they're gone, we can go back to enjoying ourselves. Well, next thing you know, a little while later, they come back, you know, guns blazing, literally. So if a situation like that were to occur to you or around you where, you know, there's some people that are causing trouble and they leave, you know, keep in the back of your mind that they might come back, they might come back with friends or they might come back with friends, right? Uh, <laughs> something that's going to, yeah. And uh, so, you know, at the very least, you know, position yourself if you're going to be still in this, in a, in a place like that, you know, that you can see the door, that you know where the exits are. Uh, you know, if you're not a, ready to leave, maybe a back exit. Most, most bars, most restaurants have a back exit where the kitchen is. So if you know where the kitchen's at, beeline for the kitchen, there's probably a door there. So, you know, it's situations that occur like this when we read about them in a paper, you know, don't just, you know, peruse through the article and, you know, kind of blow it off and be like, hey, I'm glad it wasn't me. It, it really stinks, you know, for those people. But use it as a learning experience. You know, think about to yourself, what would I have done had that been me in that situation? So, so think about that. Now, secondly, you know, as if a situation like that being close to home uh, and that sort of violence isn't, isn't, you know, enough for us, think about others who live in other countries that have it way worse than we do in this country. For example, there are protesters right now in Iraq that are being shot and killed by their own government's security forces. Uh, just this past Sunday, over a dozen, a dozen protesters were killed. And in the span of six days, six days, not even a week, 100 people have been killed and more than 6,000 wounded. Just pr protesting. Oh These are people being, yeah, it's crazy. They're being hurt and killed by their own government. And it's not only Iraq. Uh, we have in Hong Kong over the past weekend, there was a ban on the face mask. You know, we know all these, a lot of people over in the Orient, we see them wearing these face masks. They do it to keep themselves more healthy, right? There's lots of germs around, confined spaces, the smog, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this ban that went into effect basically sent tens of thousands of protesters into the streets. Uh, and what happened? Riot police responded. Volleys of tear gas. Many people are being arrested. And basically, it's turning peaceful protests into widespread violence and chaos. 
So the ban has had really the opposite effect. It's been a redoubling of the determination wow. by these people trying to you know, peacefully march and protest. Uh, and of course, then you can have the more radical segment of those protesters as well that might be, you know, trying to incite violence or, you know, do things against the officers. So the bottom line is at home, at abroad, there's always a likelihood of violence. So you got to keep your head on a swivel. You got to pay attention to your surroundings and be aware of what's going on around you, no matter where you are, whether it's your ha hometown or halfway around the world. And so that's really going to be a perfect segue into today's Yes, because she's a victim advocate, uh, and she has taken her overseas experience, speaking of overseas experience, uh, with the State Department and has turned that into a platform to help others navigate safe travel. She has spent uh, a dozen years, 12 years in both Europe and Asia. She's visited more than 35 countries, and in the process, she has developed a system to keep the most important people in your life safe while they're traveling. Uh, she was invited to the White House to discuss student safety abroad uh, and is a fierce advocate for legislation to protect our students while they're traveling abroad. Uh, she has also developed an individual travel assessment plan as well as a safe student abroad assessment. And these are designed to mitigate risk for student travelers. The, uh, she also teaches her clients about you know, different strategies and tools and techniques that can promote personal safety and mitigate their risk. She is the CEO and co-founder of Global Secure Resources, and it's my pleasure to welcome Carrie Pascarello to Safety Talk. Hey, welcome, Carrie. Hi, how are you tonight? Very happy to be here to talk about safety and students. Absolutely. So thank you so much for being Definitely, here. Yes. We're excited to have you on, uh, talk about what, you know, what your company does to keep, uh, you know, people and students safe abroad. Uh, as you know, student safety is a passion of mine as well. Uh, my last book, The Ultimate Guide to College Safety, I promoted an entire chapter to travel safety because it covers not just traveling on, you know, around campus, right? People, students go to towns and cities where they're not familiar with what's there, but it also covers, you know, what to do and how to stay safe while you're traveling abroad, spending semesters abroad, different foreign countries, you know, customs. I mean, there's so much that, that we could talk about, but, um, uh, so, so we're going to cover as much as we can <laughs> in our time together. Uh, now, many people aren't fully aware, perhaps, of the impact that, you know, being a victim or that victimization can have on the lives of the victims of a crime. And you had mentioned that, in some of the information you sent to me, that you've worked in direct services with victims and survivors. Uh, you've, you've been an advocate for change and a focus on how to prevent that. So maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit more about that as we get rolling here. Yeah, so one, one of the things I did as a rape crisis counselor was, first of all, the 24-hour hotline, but also the community awareness and prevention programming. Um, I also accompanied um, survivor speakers out to uh, talk about um, the effects that um, surviving a sexual assault has had on them. Um, one of the things that, um, that we always want to try to do is to prevent victimization. So it's, it's one of those um, very delicate situations. And I think as we talk about uh, students going back to school, a really important thing to focus on is this red zone. Have you heard about the red zone? I have an idea as to what I think it might be, but um, let's, uh, let's just define that because I'm sure people are thinking, hmm, yeah. red zone. Okay, so, what is that? So the red zone refers to the period of time when new students arrive on campus, you know, from August, September, October, and November. And according to this research, it's the time where predators are most likely to sexually assault freshman students. And that's just outrageous. So it's really important for us to be able to talk about this so that we can prevent victimization and, and really prepare our students with uh, strategies, tools, and techniques. Um, another fact uh, surrounding the red zone is that more than 50% of the campus sexual assaults happen during this period of time. And the majority of these assaults are happening between midnight and 6 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday mornings. So once again, it's an area, a, a time frame that we need our students to be at a higher elevated rate of, of, uh, of protection. Um, and another thing to uh, keep in mind is that according to the Department of Justice, the majority of these assaults are not committed by strangers, but acquaintances. So when we think about um, um, how 
our students are arriving on campus. They have so many new things that they're experiencing. One of the really important things to talk about is alcohol, alcohol consumption and um, the three A's, which I don't know if you're aware of this one, but the alcohol alone and at night, it's sort of like the Bermuda Triangle for our <laughs> students. Yep. And um, right now, we've had, during this red zone period, uh, we've already lost three students. Um, so far this year. So far. This is just the ones that I'll talk about tonight. But here up in the Boston area, we have uh, Daniel Hollis. He was uh, with Emerson College. He was an amazing kid, a la lacrosse player, a great student. He was out after a party. Uh, there was a fight. He was hit. He went into a coma. They got him to the hospital, and he's just he's just passed. Oh, that's so uh, heartbreaking. Uh, oh, jeez. The police are, are you know asking for anybody with information to come forward, but uh, once again in this red zone, a student has passed. And we have another one down in Pennsylvania. He's uh, he was a student at Bloomberg University. He was a freshman. Justin King. I'm not sure if you heard about him, but he that's just nearby uh, us here. I mean, right, right, but Neil and I are both in PA. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he just uh, died as a result of blunt force trauma consistent with a fall. And um, it just so happens that there have been other students in this particular area that have uh, previously died. Well, it is a very scary situation because when, you know, we try to educate our children when they're going away, as, you know, they're going away from home for the first time. As parents, you know, we can no longer keep an eye on them, make sure what time they're coming home every night, et cetera. So they have this vast amount of freedom that all of a sudden is available to them. And they aren't always aware, and, and I would say probably all the time not aware, of all the different risks to their personal safety that exist when they go away to school. I mean, alcohol is a huge player in all of these things because you drink too much, you fall down, you hurt yourself or kill or, or die as a result of, of major injury or trauma, right? And then of course we have the alcohol related incidents with regard to the sexual assaults on campus. And all of these things, many, many times there is alcohol related, you know, alcohol is related to these incidents in some way. Either the victim was drinking, the perpetrator was drinking or both. And so your decisions are clouded. Uh, then you have to start worrying about, you know, are different sorts of uh, date rape drugs being put into the alcohol that's being consumed. And so now you have that whole other element, which can obviously cause somebody to be completely either uh, unable to move uh, while being conscious, which is a really scary thing, uh, or unconscious, and then wake up and realize, hey, something's not right here. And yeah. so the education of the students is of paramount importance, and, and I'm definitely going to want you to talk a little bit more about these assessments, uh, tests that you, you've got here, these assessments. But it is so critical as parents that we try to prepare the, our children as best they can and let them know, hey, look, alcohol poisoning can happen the first time you drink. You might think you're going to be able to handle your liquor. You're not. You're going to find out real fast. And the first time you wake up with a hangover that makes you feel like you want to cut your head off, you're going to realize, oh, now I know what mom and dad was talking about, right? So yeah. well, all these different yeah. things. And it's, I'm sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, and also uh, when we look at, um, you were just talking about alcohol poisoning. Each year we have over 1,800 college students that die because of alcohol poisoning. In addition to that, we have... Over 600,000 students between the ages of 18 and 24 that are assaulted by another student who has been drinking. So it's not just our student, but it's other right. students that, um, you know, might get into a scuffle. And that's exactly probably what happened with Daniel here at Emerson College. Um, and, and, you know, an, another sad statistic is 97,000 students between the age of 18 and 24 report experiencing the alcohol related sexual assaults and date rapes, just like you were talking about. Yeah. And, they, and they're scary numbers. I mean, when you look at, I mean, the statistics on women are, you know, basically one in four women will be the victim of a sexual assault at some point in their college career. Some of the statistics in other countries, you mentioned, um, you have a friend uh, overseas in Australia, some of the numbers over there are staggering. Some of the numbers in some of the South American countries and the Asian countries, I mean, the numbers are even worse. And we have to make sure that, you know, we're doing what we can to be responsible men uh, in 
respecting women. And of course, you know, we can't discriminate, right? And women respecting men because it could happen the other way around, right? You know, no, no, no. Well, hey, uh, but things can happen. And sometimes they happen so fast that we don't even realize what's, what's happening. And so simply bringing the awareness to what can occur can go a long way in helping keep our children safe when they go away to school. That's right. And, and another interesting fact is a lot of these assaults are taking place in the dorm. And like I said about that time frame of the Saturday and Sundays, some of our parents might say when their student goes off to college, be really careful at the party. But in reality, we really have to tell them, be super careful when you leave that party. So it's that, that time after you've left the party, you might not be making uh, really good choices after drinking, mm -hmm. and you might invite somebody back to your dorm or go into somebody else's dorm. So it's really important. Um, you know, this, this might be a really incredible, difficult time, but parents play such an important role by having um, this uncomfortable conversation with their student now, because as a rape crisis right. counselor, it's a lot easier to have the prevention conversation than a conversation after uh, an assault has taken place. Exactly. And the thing you're, you, you're completely right about this, that discussing things with young people now before it happens gives them the resources necessary to handle a situation when it happens a lot better than if they weren't informed. And I think that the numbers that are out there, when you talk about how many uh, men and women are sexually assaulted on college campuses, if you really, they're not hearing that in high school. It's something that needs to be discussed in high school before they go to college and also has to be discussed in, uh, especially in freshman orientation so that they understand that there are resources available and that it's okay to say something because years ago, they just basically ignored it, right? It was just, a, it, was, it was not even, there's no question that any time a woman, a woman reported a sexual assault that anything would happen. Now with some of things changing, it's happening. Even if it's alcohol related and the person was not informed about how that could be sexual assault, there goes the, again the conversation with the person that does the assault not knowing really what the laws are and how you have to protect yourself. And the laws are different everywhere, too. So, I mean, depending on where you go to school, one state may have a certain definition of assault and another state may not. Now, they've standardized a lot of that through the, the Cleary organization and uh, foundation. And so, you know, some things have gotten more standardized, but, you know, the numbers only go so far. Uh, it's all, you know, and, and you know, one of the things we're talking about is individual responsibility because it does fall back on the individual. Tell us a little bit about, uh, Carrie, the the assessment forms that you're talking about. You have this uh, safe student abroad assessment, and then uh, I guess going hand in hand with that is this individual travel uh, assessment plan. Let's right. talk about the student one first. Right, and and coming back to even our call, our parents that are sending our college students off to school, one of the best things that our parents could do is research the local police reports. I'm sure you've looked at that and compare that to the Clary reports. So if you're asking for the, um, the annual security and safety reports from the university that, you, that you're sending your student to, and then asking for the local police department to share with, with you from the crime analysis unit their statistics, it's fascinating. Because you look at, um, for instance, in the town that I come from, uh, we look at, we have our statistics from the police department that are released um, every four weeks. And we can actually compare like what our homicide, our rapes, robberies, commercial robberies, street robberies, ag aggravated assaults. The car part one crimes are so important for parents to look at because our student will be in that town. They're not just gonna stay on campus, they're gonna be exploring. So that just goes into really important ways that our parents can do their research and really share that with their students so that they can be prepared with situational awareness. And I know you like situational awareness. <laughs> but back to the safety student abroad assessment, um, at any time we have students that go overseas, we like to look at 15 critical things you should know before you go. 
So what we uh, what we include in our uh, threat assessment plans, our student safety assessments, are uh, the crime assessment, terrorism assessment. We look at civil disorder, and you were talking about civil disorder earlier. It's really critical for our students to have these strategies, tools, and techniques in order to stay safe. And it all comes down to research. We need to understand exactly what we're stepping into so that we can protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe. And I think- So the assessment basically is a way to objectively take a look at where are you planning on going away for a semester? Let's take a look at these different areas in, you know, of safety, basically, and, and probably some other things as well, of where you you would like to go and then say, hey, all right, does this match up with something that is congruent with a, a safe location? Or is this someplace that maybe you want to rethink where you're going for someplace that might be a little safer? Yeah, and it, it's really interesting because being overseas, um, we were re we were briefed by the State Department, the Justice Department, by the regional security officers, and we really had an idea about where we were stepping into whichever country we were going to. And this is one of the ways that state, the State Department can send people into really dangerous areas because as long as you understand, you know the risk, you can avoid the risk. You have a backup plan, you have a secondary backup plan and a third backup plan. So even for our students that are studying abroad, you just never know when a critical incident will occur and you have to be prepared for it. So as we look at our safety assessment where we go over these 15 critical things you should know, as we do that, it's yes. really giving our students a new skill set surrounding emergency management. Because you can take this assessment and do it anywhere, whether it's around the corner in, in California or Florida or, or, or Virginia, right? Or you can do it over in Rome and you know, anywhere else in the world. As long as you're looking at these critical 15 things that you should know before you go. And it, like I said, it's a lot of uh, research but it's well worth it and it can keep our students safe as they, as they travel abroad. Now so we talk about, no, I wanted to talk about when you talk about those incidents that happen, one of the biggest cases, and I forgot her name and it'll come to me probably when I'm talking to you five minutes later, the girl from Italy that the, went to Italy and then yeah, got Amanda Knox. Yeah. That story absolutely showed that the legal system is different. So when people end up getting in trouble in other countries, the legal system is not like the United States. So if somebody, if they have the right evidence, they're going to convict you without really giving you a good case, as in with the Amanda Knox case. So that's the biggest concern about you. They need to be informed of that checklist because they could do something in certain, and let's give you another example. If you end up in a really uh, different country with the, the laws are completely different to the United States, you might get in some little skirmish and it could cost you never leaving. Yeah. These are things that have to be, uh, that people need to know before they send, especially even the family send their kids out to another that, country. That is so critical. So that's also included in our individual threat assessment plans, our student safety assessments, as we look at laws where you're traveling to. It's very important to understand human right, issue, uh, human right issues uh, wherever you go. For instance, if you're over in certain countries where they have a Sharia law, for example, if you report a sexual assault and the person you um, are accusing is not convicted, then what happens is you both are convicted for premarital sex, which is against Sharia law. So we've had uh, people over um, overseas in uh, Saudi Arabia and some other areas where they ended up in jail because they were raped. So you have to understand the laws where you're traveling to. We've also had some interesting situations over in Japan where we had a American travel over there. She was planning on teaching uh, English but she was on ADD medication. It's, it's outlawed there. So as soon as they found um, that she had that in her, her, I guess it was mailed to her, they went into a restaurant. She was out at a restaurant with a group of people and a bunch of men in black suits came in and took her away. Nobody knew where she went. It just so happened they drove her a couple hundred miles away to a prison and she sat there. Typically what happens when an American is arrested 
uh, the, the country will contact the American embassy and let them know that there's an American citizen arrested. But that didn't happen right away. So people didn't know where she was. And by the time they figured it out, um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a terrible situation because she thought she was okay to have her medication because she had a doctor's prescription. It's so crazy because that's just one example, but it's a, it really hits home. The other thing is, you know, in the United States, it's innocent until proven guilty. In a lot of other countries, it's guilty until proven innocent. And so they don't want to hear that you didn't do it. There's no presumption of innocence. It's, you know what, this person accused you of a crime, you're going to jail and then we'll figure it out. And you could languish in a prison, especially in some foreign country for a long time while they sort through the facts. So it definitely behooves everybody to do their due diligence, to look at the State Department's recommend recommendations for any of the countries that you're looking to go to. They have some great resources on their website. Um, I cite a bunch of them in my book that you should use in order to make sure that you're going somewhere. Like you said, the medication thing. You know, if you do have medication with you, keep the doctor's note and a copy of the prescription with the medication. So it says that, you know, you are, you know, with your name on it, this is a prescription of, for this medication for this person. So you can say, look, this was prescribed to me. Now, if it's an outlawed medication, you can't have it anyway. But if it's at least something that uh, you are allowed to have, you can prove that the, the, the prescription is for you by having that you know, copy of the prescription, copy of the doctor's note that says such. So there's so many things that we have to worry about. I mean, foreign customs, you know, how you approach people, your distance between people, you know, how you touch people, you know, can you, you know, you can't shake a hand, you know, of a woman in certain countries, you know, if you're in the Orient and you touch a little kid on the head, like, oh, you're so cute. That's like a huge insult. So there's all these different little nuances that in order to be as safe as possible, you've got to, as you said, it's going to take some time, you know, and I could just see all the kids out there rolling their eyes going, do I really have to do this? Nothing's going to happen to me, right? Because that's what the kids do. So as parents, we have to say, yes, if you want to go, then this is what we're going to do. We're sitting down and we're going to do the research and you're going to do the research with me and you're going to learn why we have to do this research so that you are prepared for anything that could potentially occur when you're thousands of miles away from me, the parent. And the kids got to understand that, okay, I understand, you know, and we put it in terms that they understand. I'm the parent. I care about you. I want to make sure that you have all the resources and the information, the knowledge, the tools, et cetera, to keep you safe when you're not here with me. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think that rolls right into the new legislation that I'm trying to push. Oh, okay. Tell us about that. So you were just saying how important it is to, you know, tell your student, this is why we're going to do it. It is amazing. Do you know that there's no statistics available for assaults, injuries, or deaths of our American students studying abroad? None. It's an unregulated industry, an unregulated billion dollar industry. And the biggest reason why we need these statistics is and I'll, I'll make it a, a simple analogy, is the CDC. So they have, uh, for instance, all the statistics of how Americans die. And let's take heart disease, for example. So they started counting how many people were dying of heart disease, and then they developed ways of reducing that. So they thought, we got to eat better, we got to exercise, and then we started reducing the number of heart disease deaths. So the same thing with, heart, with car accidents. They started tracking the numbers. They got the data-driven analysis. And they saw how many people were dying in car accidents. They developed the seatbelt. People started wearing the seatbelt and were saving lives. Well, right now, we have counted over 200 American students that have been killed on study abroad. Oh, my so goodness. That's a big number. And, wow. Yeah. And this is why we need the data-driven analysis because – the, the sad fact about that number is there's a couple of nonprofits that I collaborate with, and they were started because of the death of students studying abroad. And these moms got together, and they've really been trying to push for new legislation because they, they appreciated the fact that their student wanted to study abroad. But they want it safer. They don't want another family to lose another child overseas. So as I worked with them, I went up to uh, the state house here 
and I asked Senator Saldi Domenico to file a bill, and he filed a bill called an Act Protecting Students Abroad. It's Bill S743. And what we're asking is that we prioritize the health and safety and security of programs as they develop them, conduct risk assessments, maintain written emergency uh, plans and protocols, establish statistical reporting of all deaths, assaults, and injuries while participating in a school-sponsored study abroad. And this will add transparency for the parents to be able to look at the protocols and statistics to review. No, it makes perfect sense. I mean, because we're trying to send our kids somewhere to further their education. We want to make sure they're safe. And if there's no barometer that allows us to say this country is safer than that country, or there have been next number of crimes in this country and Y number of crimes in that country related to whatever, uh, it's very hard to make those decisions. And, you know, how much time would it take for us to try to do all of that research on our own, right? So it makes perfect sense that the government would begin to track those numbers to allow people to go and find out, hey, what are the numbers on, you know, incidents to students who are, you know, who have studied abroad in the past? I think it's a great idea. Yeah. And, and really, and another thing that we want is the staff and students on studying abroad um, to be trained to anticipate and respond responsibly to health and safety and security issues. And, but, but the most the, the saddest thing I think about this is also with Global Secure Resources, we do uh, litigation support. So there was a case that we helped with um, of a student that went to Rome, and uh, he died within the first 24 hours of landing in Rome. What? Now, what is absolutely shocking about that is how would you feel if you were the mom, your yeah. son has died, and then oh, you found goodness. out there were seven other students that died there. But they didn't know because didn't nobody know. told them. They didn't oh know. Gosh. Nobody told them. There's no statistics. So you, they need those numbers. And if it's another country, it's very hard to have a global statistics, right? Yeah. So, but the interesting thing is we get all the statistics through the state department. We, you know, when a, an American citizen dies, they're notified. They, um, you know, the body is shipped back to America. There's a whole protocol. So we, we know how many American citizens are dying overseas. And for instance, if we just look at the first uh, six months of this year, we've had over 330 Americans um, die overseas. Wow. Now, what's, what's interesting about that statistic is it doesn't include natural deaths which is a really interesting thing because if you think back to the Dominican Republic when we were having that, um, those number of, of, parent, of people that have died over in the Dominican Republic, do you remember when Big Poppy was shot over there and, and there was a lot of uh, news, news that was coming out around? Yes, the yes. Mm -hmm. Well, during that time, um, it, was, it, was, it was kind of found out that the, some of the people that were dying of that methanol, alcohol tainted poisoning that we assumed, some of their symptoms were they would have a heart attack. Well, that went under natural death, so it wasn't counted. Right. Yeah. See, that's that was actually what I was going to say. Is you know how did they determine what is a like a violent crime related death versus natural cause? Well. They are, but the line is blurred because some of those that appear to be naturally occurring could, in fact, have been caused by something else. Exactly. And, uh, and that, that's really scary. And I mean, you know, parents, you know, again, we want our children's horizons to be broadened. We want them to experience other cultures, other languages, other people, see the world. I mean, the United States is such a young, young country. Other countries have been around for many, many more hundreds and thousands of years than we are. And so it's just, it's amazing because I know personally, my parents took myself and my two sisters to an incredibly amazing family vacation uh, when I was in college and when my sisters were both in high school, we went to Greece and we went to Egypt. And it was almost a month-long vacation. My sisters both got bitten by the travel bug. And they both actually work for the State Department and they travel all over the world. And my one sister lives in Australia now and the other one just came back from Rome. So they've gone all over the place as a result of that initial bug that was planted by us, you know, traveling when they were younger. And my one sister who went to Rome actually uh, did some uh, 
work where she was out like building roads in Greece or something like that for a couple of summers. So it was really neat because, you know, I think every kid, every person should experience other countries, other cultures, and other ways of doing things. But, and the big but here is safely. You have to be able to do it safely, know what you're getting into, and not just blindly go and think it's going to be the same as the United States because it is not the same as in this country or in your own country of origin for that matter. It could be somebody, you know, coming from, you know, like a foreign exchange student coming to the United States. They may not know what to expect. And so, you know, it can flip around the other way on them as well. If they're coming here from some other country, right? Absolutely, because we have absolutely everything that's happening overseas happening here. We have terrorism, we have civil disorder, we have medical issues, we have absolutely everything. I think the difference is, some, uh, sometimes for our parents, is we're sending our students 3,000 plus miles away, right? And so we need to make sure. But I will yes. add, I will add that, um, you know, during my time overseas, I had a student in every single grade from first grade to a graduating senior. And then I had a study abroad student even after that. So um, it was one of the most incredible experiences for our family. My kids all loved it. They had amazing cultural agility. They came out speaking. They learned, um, they were learning Arabic. They learned to speak Italian. They learned to speak Chinese. They learned to speak Thai. So it was one of the best experiences of their life. And so I really want, you know, I love the fact that uh, students are studying abroad. I really love that they can go and explore the world and have an amazing experience, but I want it to be done safe. And that's where, you know, our tools, strategies, and techniques come in, you know, into play is we can prepare them and then it's a critical skill set that they'll have for their whole entire life, no matter where they live, which will make them even a better um, a global citizen. Absolutely. So what can parents do? Uh, you know, getting to kind of the crux of, of the problem, what can parents do that will enhance the safety of their children when they're traveling abroad? So I guess when we when we think about the strategies, tools, and techniques, if we take just strategies for a minute and we think about situational awareness and we think about teaching them the two R's, which is risk and resource and a baseline check, these are simple strategies to, that will increase your situational awareness. Because oftentimes what I've seen is when, when um, a school send the students off and they go to, let's say, a pre-departure preparation session, um, the majority of the time is spent, what are you going to pack in your bag, how exciting it's going to be, what your classes are going to be like, where are you going to live, which are all great, and then just a little snippet about um, stay in groups and have situational awareness. But if you're not going to develop how to increase your situational awareness, it's kind of worthless. And if you're not going to uh, take the time and teach kids about baseline checks and risks and resources, it's, it's just not going to be a robust um, safety planning session. So what I want parents to do is to really be able to take the strategies of improving their child's situational awareness by uh, increasing it. And you can do this with the two R's and the baseline check. And of course, the assessment that you've put together. And uh, yes, of course. And they can always do the assessment, the 15 critical things that they need to know, they can actually um, go on our website and see some of the, um, the, the articles that I've written about safety and security, and they can call us up and we can really get them all situated with how they can do their own research. But if they want us to do it, that's great. My whole point is do the research. There's a way, a structure of doing it, and we can all benefit from um, having our student do the research. That would be even better. Oh, yeah. It's almost like a combo. So if students do the research, then they're more likely to remember them, right? Exactly. Put them to work, right? If they sure. want to go overseas. I always got to put them to work, right? That's the only way to get these millennials to be focused and motivated is put them to work. <laughs> Not always the easiest thing to do, but making them understand the reasons why and you know, being there for them to sort of support them in that process and let them know that, you know, you can't just look through the, you know, at the world through rose colored glasses all the time, right? I mean, there are risks, there are threats, there are always going to be things that can, you know, 
cause them to have, uh, you know, safety related problems. And even more so if they're not aware of what those problems are. And so by developing these good safety habits from, you know, being from a young person, uh, it's going to allow them to, as you, you know, put it, Carrie, a, a global citizen that is responsible and that is safe and is going to be able to enjoy their traveling much more. You know, and I get people say, well, you know, isn't that being a little, you know, paranoid? No. If you're prepared, it allows you to relax. If you're not prepared, that's when you get all excited about things, right? Because it's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? This happened. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Well, if you thought about it, if you plan for something, whatever that thing happens to be, now your plan can kick into action and you can do it with a calm, cool head that allows you to hopefully get through whatever that problem happens to be safely. Yeah. And another interesting thing is I always talk, uh, this would be one of the tools that, that we use is the stash band. So it's like a, um, a money belt that goes underneath your clothes. You put your, your cell phone, a passport, some money. And then if the worst case scenario, you get your bag stolen, you can still get a taxi, get a hotel and get the heck out of the country if you need to. But interestingly enough, we just had a, a, a big bust in Rome. There was a gang of 12 thieves that were targeting wealthy foreigners at Fumicino Airport. And um, what they did was they, they were doing an undercover sting. And so I actually put up on my Twitter account the video so you can watch how sly these criminals are. And they had been stealing people's um, bags right out of the airport. Oh, it's, it's, it's just amazing. And these, this gang of thieves were coming in from France and from Spain. They would come in and uh, they would work for a little while, collect all their money, go back to where they were living. Wow. But this is one of the things with, um, with when we talk about crime in my assessment, we talk about um, how criminals actually target their victims, but some of their techniques that they use. And they, they seem to really like the distraction method. And so it's typically two, three, four, it could be five. This, this case, it was 12 of them. And they'll distract, they'll go out, they'll identify who they want to steal from. And then they just move in. They'll tap you, they'll ask a question, they'll distract you. Meanwhile, their accomplices are grabbing the cell phone, the wallet, and your, and your purse and your bag. So, so petty crime is a billion dollar industry. And, but it's not so, it's not, you know, it's a, it might not be a big deal, you think petty crime, but if it's your passport and your cell phone and you're stuck standing in a foreign country without a means of communication or a means of getting out of the country, it's a huge deal. You got a big problem on your hands. Absolutely. That's why yeah. anybody traveling should always have with them printed, not in just the cell phone digital format, the information about the nearest embassy to where the nearest embassy is to them. So that at least, you know, you can have somebody you can go to a, a, a gate or an office, you know, like an officer or somebody, or a, even an information, you know, kiosk and say, Hey, I was just robbed. I need to get a hold of the American embassy. Here's the phone number. You have, you have a phone I can use that way. It saves you the time of having to find the number and all of that stuff. So you have to prepare ahead of time again, because preparation is what's going to take your stress levels down. I encourage people to go look up exactly where they're going. Look at a map of the area, look and see, are there any natural borders that would hinder you from leaving an area rapidly? Right. Uh, is there any natural threats you know, where are you going to be staying? Could, is there a possibility that there could be a flood or is there, is it going to be near, you know, are you going to be somewhere where they get maybe a lot of snow? Maybe you're going to Switzerland or something, right? And there's going to be a ton of snow there. Are you prepared for that? What would happen if the, this thing were to occur? So it's not always the threats from another person, right? Definitely it's the not. threats from nature and it's the threats <laughs> from ourselves sometimes too. Right. right. Some of these countries that they go to are not going to have adequate drinking water. They're not going to have adequate uh, medical attention. So let's say they're taking a cruise, right? Sometimes there's abroad a cruises as well for um, that, that are part of this whole abroad learning, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And so that kind of brings me into another area, which is um, insurance. It's so important to have the best medical medical evacuation insurance in place and to actually call the company and find out what is not included. And I'll tell you a little story about a woman who was in uh, Phuket 
and she was on, she just rented one of those little Vespas. She ended up being hit head on with a car. Uh, she ended up in the, uh, the Phuket hospital, racking up thousands and thousands of dollars of, of uh, costs. And she, her family thought, well, she's okay. She has her insurance. But the insurance came in and said, did you read the fine print? You had to have a class B motorcycle license to rent a motorcycle. So therefore it was void. She had $67,000 bill that she had to pay before she could even get out of the hospital. Oh my God. So she, there she was stuck and she had to uh, have a GoFundMe page and it took a number, you know, a number of weeks to get even enough money for her to get out of the country. That's ridiculous. And, I, you know, from personal experience, I can tell you having adequate medical travel insurance is invaluable. My mother is a, is an avid traveler. Uh, obviously, she got all of us hooked. <laughs> uh, and she was traveling in a foreign country. I can't remember exactly where she was on some cruise and they were visiting places. And she was walking down a, a slippery cobblestone street. And it was early in the morning and it was dew on it. And she started to lose her balance and she fell and she smashed her face really good. Well, her medical insurance paid to send a nurse out to get her, get her on the plane with her, and fly back to the United States, first class, right to a hospital where I met them, and thank God everything turned out okay, but for a period of 12, 15 hours, it was really hairy because I didn't know the shape my mother was in, I didn't know how bad her injuries were, I didn't know what was going to happen. Luckily, the insurance that she had took care of everything and it was phenomenal I, I wish i could remember the name of the organization i think it was out of like texas or something it was like it's interesting you know, it's interesting because one of the things that i recommend as well is um medjet so you have you will have your medical evacuation insurance but this is a as an extra supplement so that what happens is sometimes when you're overseas and you have a major catastrophe and you need to be medevac somewhere they'll medevac you to the nearest hospital that that can take care of you. So if you're over in Europe, maybe they'll take you to England. Mm -hmm. So, but what Medjet does will bring you back 50 miles from your hometown. So wow. it, it's, it's really a wonderful feature because oftentimes it's hard for your family to go over to the foreign country, wherever you are to sit uh, bedside for you. But if you can be transferred back to, uh, you know, close by your home, that's even better. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people don't even think about that, you know, so I'm glad you brought that up, Carrie, because medical travel insurance is absolutely essential for anybody that's traveling abroad. And I'll just tell you one more crazy story. We had a student off um, for, for spring break in Mexico. He fell, had a traumatic brain injury, and he thought he had insurance. He didn't. His father had to liquidate his 401k, $100,000 to get him home. That is just see. That's just so sad because sad. with a little bit of a little bit of information, a little bit of planning, a little bit of research ahead of time, would have prevented that potentially from ever having to happen to that to that person and to their father. Because that's you know that's devastating. I mean, that is now that's affecting your whole rest of your life from a mistake that you made because you didn't adequately do the research and understand it. And so, you know, traveling, no matter who you are, obviously, you know, we're talking about students, but doesn't matter who you are, you've got to take every precaution and every preparation you could possibly think of using different resources like the ones that, that Carrie has at her uh, through her site, right? GlobalSecureResources.com is your website. And uh, there's lots of information on that page. I was looking at it uh, earlier today. So that's, uh, it's a great resource. The, um, the bottom line is that, you know, I'll let you have sort of the the the, the last uh, sort of thoughts here because uh, they're very similar to what I was going to say, and and I think uh, <laughs> I know you're going to go with it, Carrie, uh, about you know some last thoughts for our audience because people can be overwhelmed, right? When we, especially if we're trying to do something for our kids or doing stuff for ourselves, there's usually a lot to do. You know, it's funny because they say people plan their vacations better than they plan their lives, right? Um, and in this case, you have to plan your travel itinerary and it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, for a vacation, but you've got to plan it, not just where are we going and what are we seeing, but how can we remain safe? And if there's an issue while we're gone or we're in some other country, you know, how can we reduce those risks? How can we eliminate those risks? And how can we keep ourselves and our family and our children safe? So, 
what would uh, what would your sort of wrap up or, or thoughts for the audience be if you could kind of sum it up for us? Right. Well, I, I would add in one extra resource that's pretty awesome. It's called the um, the WanderSafe beacon and app, which is really great that I love. But also, I would just say... I know, the, I know the owner of that. Are you familiar with Stephanie and WanderSafe? I, I am. I just met her on Friday. So oh, we'll have to talk about her after the yes, show here. Definitely will help. <laughs> so she is phenomenal, fabulous, and um, that's a really great product. But I would, I would say preventing victimization, victimization starts with improving personal safety. And it really goes back to our three Ps, which is proactive, prepared, and protected, no matter where we go. And it really comes down to our strategies, tools, and techniques. And I just want to say, travel the world, have an amazing time. There's so much to see and do out there. I just want everybody safe, and I want parents to know there are strategies for them to keep their students safe, their loved ones safe. Uh, that's it's great and what your service is not a lot of people are doing something like this and it's a definite valuable resource especially when families are very nervous especially when you talk about sending their college students to study abroad and the challenges that can happen there and you have brought up a lot of them tonight that will make people think about this for sure but also want to utilize your resources sure you know personal safety is on the individual. It's your individual responsibility, right? So as a student, it's on you when you're away. You know, your parents aren't going to be there to help you or to bail you out of a bad situation when you're three, four, five thousand miles away, right? You can't just say, hey, come pick me up. It, <laughs> oh yeah, hold on. Let me get on a private jet. I'll be right there, right? No, it doesn't happen. So the responsibility of the individual has to be of paramount importance here. Uh, we want to prevent people from being victims. And the only way to do that is by preparing adequately, by paying attention through situational awareness, through the different things that we've been talking about here this evening, and also talking about and making sure that the risks are understood. And if they're held up to whatever personal barometer you have and the risks are too high, then nothing says you've got to you know, follow through with those travel plans, right? You can always change them. You can decide to go somewhere else. Sure, it might be a little convenient, but what's more inconvenient, right? Your safety <laughs> or not, right? <laughs> I think we would all agree that, you know, if we're not safe and secure and, you know, on above the ground, that nothing else really matters, right? So it's a, it's a very important thing that it, it, it is well worth the time and the effort to do the preparation ahead of time because otherwise, if you find yourself in a situation with no clue how to deal with it, you're going to be way worse off, no matter who you are. Absolutely. And I would just have to say, once again, the prevention conversation's a lot easier than the conversation about the aftermath of an assault. So we got to keep our, our loved ones safe. We can do more. Yes. Nobody, nobody wants to go down Definitely. that road. No, Neil, any last thoughts, Neil? Um, I guess really just, uh, just to think about specifically enough what can happen. And I guess think sometimes in security, we have to think the worst, not the most. Uh, we have to look at the glass half full, half empty, not half full because of just, you never know when something crazy will happen, especially when you're traveling abroad. Sure. And you know, every single person that's ever been the victim of anything has, they've all said the same thing. I never thought it would happen to me. Right? I don't think anybody has ever been the victim of a robbery, a theft, an assault, a home invasion, or any other thing you could possibly think of and said, you know, I thought that would always happen to me one day. No, nobody says that. They all say, I never thought it would happen to me. Because when we look at anything in the news or anything that we hear about, it's easy to distance ourselves from it and say, well, that happened to that person. That, that's not going to happen to me. Well, I'm here to tell every single person listening that it can happen to you. It may happen to you. And the likelihood of a problem occurring to you is going to go up dramatically if you ignore it and you don't take the time to prepare for your own personal safety, regardless of where you are and what you're doing. So for I, I really appreciate your time, uh, Carrie, here. And uh, for any of our listeners that want additional information about college safety, we've been talking a lot about college safety uh, t on the show here in this episode, that 
Um, I have a free guide for our listeners that uh, you're able to download. It contains the six top strategies for staying safe at college, and uh, it's available at staysafeatcollege.com. Uh, this is a resource for parents, for students. Uh, it also comes with some bonus guides uh, that uh, for a limited time. So uh, I have a very special offer too for those that request the guide through, you know, by hearing about it through the show here. So uh, go there, staysafeatcollege.com if you're interested in getting some some great free information from me. A lot of it is taken from my uh, my book, The Ultimate Guide to College Safety. And uh, it's, you know, it's a way... Uh, if you go there, you're going to find out there's also a way that uh, you can actually have me teach your kids personally. That's all I'm going to say. Kind of leave that little teaser out there. So uh, again, Carrie, thanks for being on Safety Talk. And uh, thanks uh, for your time. And thanks for our listeners for tuning in. Uh, you can always get more information as well as listen to past episodes through our website, which is also a safety news aggregator, safetytalkpodcast.com. And you can find us on your favorite uh, podcast network, iTunes, iHeartRadio, et cetera, et cetera. So don't forget the free guys, guides. And uh, until next time, stay safe.